We'll give that a second to kick in. And uh, let's get going. Hi, welcome to today's Tech Talk. My name is uh, Patrick Anspink. I'm a product marketing manager with Quest Software and will serve as one of your hosts today. Our topic, as you can see on the slide, is proper password protection within Active Directory and Azure Directory environments. Um, pretty self-explanatory is the session title. There's not a pop culture reference in there that you have to uh, decode or, or dissect. Um, the best news today is that we have uh, uh, an expert, our featured presenter. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Daryl Baker, a consultant and um, Microsoft expert with Trimark Security. So Daryl, you're already on camera for a second, but just so everybody knows, take a second to say hi so the um, audience can get familiar with your voice because uh, you're going to do the bulk of the talking here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Um, like I said, here in Connecticut, it is, uh, it's a bit cold and stuff, but, you know, the great thing about being virtual is I get to be in the nice comfort of my own home. So that's great. Excellent. <laughs> nice. Nice. And uh, thanks for joining us today and, and offering your expertise and insight. And just a couple of notes before we get going. Um, we will be recording this session uh, and you can watch it, uh, share it for a rebroadcast. Uh, you send the, the, the link. We'll get that link out as soon as we can after the session is done. Um, I'm also joined by a few Quest colleagues that will assist with the chat function. Um, Fawad, and uh, uh, Hamdi and Bob Krebs. Um, they're my colleagues at Quest. And uh, so they'll keep things going uh, as as we progress on here. And I mean, speaking of chat, like it makes these sessions a lot more interactive if you chime in during the presentation and we'll answer as many questions as you can. Um, and uh, also we'll save up any questions that can't be answered during the session for Q&A. We do have time for that today. We're we're all, you know, certain in the the allotted time, um, and um, so let's just keep that active and going. I think that covers the intro, and I think you got control of the slides, Daryl. So um, let's get going and uh, make sure you have uh, plenty of time and give you the stage. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. All right, uh, thanks again, everybody, for being here. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, proper password protection within Active Directory and Azure Active Directory environments. Um, now coined as Intra ID, I know, but uh, I have found that when I use Intra ID instead of Azure AD, a lot of times people get a little confused. So um, I may use those kind of interchangeably, um, but I usually lean towards Azure AD. So for this talk, I'll probably say more of Azure AD because some of the tools that I am talking about it's much easier to find if you do a Google search uh, under Azure AD versus Intra ID. So just waiting on the internet to catch up to us. All right, so utilizing AD features to protect the keys to the kingdom. Uh, my name is Daryl Baker. Uh, as Patrick said, I'm a security consultant at Trimark Security. I am the creator of the Identity Security Village, which is an Active Directory hacking village that can be seen at a lot of different conferences. Um, we've also created a cloud uh, security village as well that we use for training. Um, I'm the resident purple teamer over at Trimark, and I specialize in Active Directory vulnerabilities as well as Azure AD. Um, I'm also kind of a radio nerd, so I'm ham radio extra. So if anybody ever wants to send me some messages about satellites or Wi-Fi or Zigbee or anything weird like that, just let me know. Um, got my pronouns down there, and my favorite is domain admin because that's what most people call me if you give me enough time in your environments. Okay, so our agenda today is first we're going to talk about why we're even talking about passwords in the first place. Then I'm going to go into uh, what I think to be quite an interesting history of passwords. Uh, we won't harp on it too long, but it's pretty interesting to see why we're still using passwords and how far we've come um, from the very beginning, the very first passwords that, that we know of. Um, we'll talk about the available password policies that exist within Active Directory as well as the password policies and what you can and can't do within Azure environments. We'll get into protected users group. We'll talk about service account passwords and why service accounts matter so much when we're talking about passwords. We'll get into local administrator uh, password management. 
as well as some of the new stuff that uh, Microsoft has put out just here in the last couple of years with uh, password protection uh, within Azure AD and Intra ID. Okay, so why are we still talking about passwords? Well, we're, we're still talking about passwords because everybody has them. Um, according to numerous various data sources, uh, the average user has about 100 different passwords. Um, and this is not a technologist or an engineer or system admin. This is just, you know, everyday Johnny who has a cell phone and multiple email addresses and bank accounts and healthcare, and he's got a job with a computer he's got to log into and, you know, it, social media, the list goes on. So these passwords start to add up very quickly. Um, also, if you've looked at the major the major breaches that have happened basically in the last 10 years and definitely within the last seven, uh, most of them have some kind of data leak or some kind of uh, credentials that were somehow compromised. Um, a lot of times these credentials that were compromised were due to either weak passwords, passwords that were used in rotation year to year for some event, um, or you know service accounts that are being uh, being attacked and they just were not properly configured. So passwords are constantly being attacked and that's not going away um, anytime soon. So in eight, uh, in 2017, Verizon reported that 81% of uh, the data breaches were due because of reused, weak, or stolen passwords. Um, now what's interesting is uh, NordPass also did a survey of 5 million people, men and, well, men and women all across the world. So out of those 5 million people, the most common password worldwide is password, all lowercase. That's it. The second most password, the second most common password worldwide is 123456. And the third most password, third most common password is 123456789. So not a lot of originality uh, in the most common passwords in the world. Um, and just to add a cherry on top of that, the most common password in the United States alone as of 2021 was guest. That's it, lowercase guest. No numbers, no special characters, nothing. Um, so this is why we're still talking about passwords because they are consistently part of our modern cybersecurity attacks. So let's get into a brief history of passwords. Um, this is actually a bit interesting to me I'm a veteran, so uh, one of the first things we start talking about whenever you first enlist into the military is you start talking about passwords and, um, you know, when you're, when you're on fire guard or you're on some kind of guard duty, you know, how you relieve your duty and the next person comes on. Because you may or may not know who that soldier is that's coming to relieve you. So this is really where the original passwords came uh, came into play. And so the first recorded passwords that we know of were recorded by the Roman military way back um, around 300 BC. And essentially there was a tablet that just had a password that was rotated out every single day. Um, every unit had their own password. So the leaders of this unit had to go and get this tablet. And as they would go down and go and check on their different troops, uh, they would they would present this tablet and it would prove that they, they were supposed to be part of this unit and that, that you know, they were supposed to be there. Um, this was known as a watchword at the time and they were used once, they were kind of the original one-time pad, because again, this was on a stone tablet. Once that night guard or whatever that, that guard uh, duty was done, the tablet would be physically destroyed and they would start over with the new tablet. So moving forward to the 1920s, where we, we're, now we're gonna get into more of your common type of, of passwords, right? So a great example would be speakeasies. So in the 1920s, uh, prohibition, made uh, the sell, the purchase, and uh, the creation of alcohol illegal in the United States. So there were these places called speakeasies that you could go to uh, illegally uh, in order to drink and be merry. Uh, in order to get into one of these, a lot of times a password was used to make sure that you weren't part of law enforcement. Now this password could be a word, it could be a phrase, secret handshake, special knock, doesn't matter but it was something that was intimate knowledge to both the people inside of the speakeasy as well as the people that wanted to get in. Uh, this is important 
because it's not really until 1944, right, post D-Day. And this was due to uh, the, the, the need to be able to communicate with allied personnel and to make sure that our, our messages were not getting intercepted by, by um, you know, Axis forces. Um, we needed to figure out how we could respond to a challenged password. And what I mean by that is with the speakeasy, for instance, when you knock on the door, you do your special knock, or maybe there's a person outside who says, hey, what's the password? You tell them the password is one, two, three, so they know that you're supposed to be there. But there is nothing in that framework that guarantees the person that you're giving the password to is actually part of the speakeasy. There's nothing to stop that person from then saying, oh, that sounds good. They turn around and they just replay that password. They let you in and then they go in. Um, so 1944 comes around post D-Day. Uh, you know, the Enigma machines have come out. Encryption is becoming this big thing. Um, you know, all, all of these encrypted messages. This is this is really a huge focus worldwide. Uh, a challenge response system came into play. So when two soldiers, um, allied forces were to meet each other for the first time or to exchange duties, uh, one would present a challenge to the other, and the other one would uh, respond with a response. Both the challenge and the response is known to both parties, and because there was a response to the challenge, both parties have now uh, mutually authenticated. Uh, a fun fact about this is in this particular uh, version of challenge and response, after the response was given, the original challenger would then say the word welcome, and it's always the word welcome. And it was because the W was a very hard sound to say with a German accent in English. So just fun history fact there. All right, so let's get into computing. All right, 1960 to 1961, really the first digital password was created. It was created at MIT with so much other computing uh, inventions uh, with the compatible time sharing system. And essentially, this was just a system that was used by researchers um, and it was created out of necessity. They needed a way to for all the different researchers to log into the same machine that's connected to the same mainframe, but to have their own set of uh, files and user space and different customizations. So this hits the ground running 1961. 1962, we have our first digital password breach. So this was actually not even four months later that this breach happened. So breaches have followed passwords since the very beginning. Um, and this digital breach actually also happened out of necessity. One of the researchers who was using the uh, CTSS, the compatible time sharing system, uh, wanted more time on the machine. So uh, they realized that they had access to the password file. They dumped the password file. They were able to see all of the user's names and all the user's passwords so they could stay on the machine indefinitely as any user. So 1974, we move into hashing, which is a one-way um, algorithm. Um, there's really no way to go backwards from it, though you can try to find some matching set of data uh, known as a collision or even potentially the original uh, set of data that was used for the hash um, in order to crack that to figure out what it is. So in 1979, Robert Morris, the same guy, uh, along with Ken Thompson, uh, creates salting. And so what salting does, is it adds random characters to a part of a password uh, before that password is hashed to make it even harder to crack. Now, uh, a funny thing about Robert Morris is he has a famous quote where he says, the three golden rules to ensure uh, computer security are, do not own a computer, do not power it on, and do not use it. So this is coming from the father of passwords, and even he said not to use computers if you're trying to use them in a fully secure and safe way. So just fun fact. 1995, AT&T invents uh, two-factor authentication. Now we're kind of into our modern days where, you know, the 2010s come into play. We're looking at multi-factor because two-factor wasn't enough. And um, even now we're looking into not even looking into it. There's a lot of especially cloud providers such as Microsoft that are really pushing for passwordless authentication. Um, really, I should air quote passwordless authentication because just because you as the user may or may not be using a password, passphrase, or PIN, in most uh, frameworks, there is some password or passphrase tied to that system somewhere. Um, so 
hard push for increased password complexity um, because of, as of 2022, an eight character password consisting of uppercase and lowercase uh, letters, numbers and symbols can be cracked in under 40 minutes. Um, any password shorter than that with the same complexity can be cracked in seconds and sometimes instantly. So that is a very important statistic uh, to keep in mind as we start moving forward and start talking about Active Directory password policies. That as of 2022, an eight character password uh, can be cracked in under 40 minutes and a password that is shorter than eight characters can potentially be, be cracked in seconds, if not instantly. Okay, so this brings us into uh, actual policies themselves. So I'm going to start with Active Directory um, on premise first, and there's a very specific reason why, which I will tell you when we get towards the end of this. So uh, Active Directory really has two places where you can enforce a password policy. There is the default domain password policy. Um, this is typically set in the default domain policy in a GPO and then pushed out to all objects um, in the environment. Um, by default, that's the way that Active Directory is, is set up. The default domain policy is at the root. So everything below the root is going to inherit this policy unless you have inheritance blocked. Um, it was originally created to apply a safe password policy throughout the entire domain and ensure that users um, had to conform to that password policy. As of uh, 2008, fine-grained password policies were created for Active Directory, which allowed administrators to create additional password policies on top of the default password policy um, in order to have more granular control over potentially uh, more sensitive groupings of objects. Maybe they are admin accounts or um, maybe they're service accounts or what have you. So this is typically configured through the uh, Active Directory Administration Center, though it can be uh, configured through PowerShell as well. Um, what makes it so powerful is that instead of being just applied to everything that's in, in you know, the domain root or everything that's within an OU, you can actually specify which specific users or groups you want this particular password policy to apply to. And then you could have a completely different password policy apply to someone else. So, for instance, you could have standard users that have a pretty complex and strong password policy, but then maybe for your admins and definitely for your service accounts, you have a much stronger password policy. Uh, actually, in my talk for Tech Live, uh, when I brought this up, somebody came to me at the end of it and brought up a really good point, um, because usually when I talk about the fine-grained password policies, I talk about having a, a normal domain password policy, and then your fine-grained password policy being one that's even more complex or, or one that, that uh, is even stronger. Um, I actually had a case that came up to me at Tech in Atlanta this year where uh, an admin needed a fine-grained password policy so that he could create a password policy that was weaker than his default uh, domain password policy, and he needed the weaker one for backwards compatibility. So all of his computer objects or user objects that he needed that were using the, these old systems were put in a, put in a specific group and then that group had a fine-grained password policy just for them. All right, so I'm going to go over relatively briefly, I'm going to go over uh, the defaults of what you get out of the box when you just spin up an Active Directory uh, domain controller or an Active Directory um, domain for the first time, and you haven't made any changes to the password uh, policy settings at all. So by default, um, uh, maximum password age is 42 days, minimum is one day. But what's interesting here is the minimum password length is seven, uh, seven characters long. So if we remember from two slides ago, where it says here, for a seven character password consisting of upper and lowercase characters, numbers, and symbols can be cracked in seconds, if not instantly. So out of the box, Microsoft is not requiring you to have a password stronger than one that can be than one that could potentially be cracked instantly. So that's something to keep in mind whenever uh, you're thinking about your password policies and definitely whenever you're spinning up new Active Directory environments. Um, another thing to keep in mind is you almost never want to store passwords using reversible encryption. 
unless you have a very specific um, business driver for the for reason why you need the uh, reversible encryption, you shouldn't do that. Um, reversible encryption was put in place back in uh, server 2000. Um, the issue with it now is it's essentially no better than storing um, a password in plain text. There are a lot of tools out there that will allow you to go ahead and just um, decrypt that reversible password, and you'll be able to see what that password is in plain text. Uh, so complexity requirements. So passwords must meet complexity requirements. Uh, so this setting is enabled by default, and this setting is a multi-setting setting. So it's got some sub-settings within it. Um, some of them are a little bit more granular and a little bit more strict than your overall settings, um, but some of them not so much. Uh, for instance, now with these complexity requirements, you can't have a part of the user account or uh, the user's you know, name inside of the actual password but the password now only needs to be six characters in length. So all of these can be changed and, and modified, but these are things to, to keep in mind that Active Directory is giving you a lot of different ways uh, to create these strong password policies, but out of the box, they're very, very weak, very, very weak. So at the bottom here, I've got a bolded note that says, uh, these password policies apply to on-premise and hybrid environments. So if you are in a, pure intra ID or pure Azure AD environment, there's not much that you can change about your Active Directory password policy. Um, you can change settings like um, account lockout. So how long an account has to be locked out before they can attempt to log back in again, but most settings are not configurable. Now, one major difference, I'm gonna air quote major on this, but one major difference between uh, the default password policy for a pure Azure AD environment and an on-premise environment is that on-premise, the uh, minimum length by default is seven characters and Azure requires eight characters. So in Azure, it would only take 40 minutes to crack that password as opposed to on-prem, which would take seconds to minutes. Um, here's just a, a picture of uh, Group Policy Management Console, just showing where the setting is uh, for your default uh, password policy. Um, so it's, it's just underneath computer configuration, security settings, account policies, and password policy. And for fine-grained password policies, uh, the easiest way, again, would be to use uh, the Active Directory Administration Center. Uh, again, you can do this from PowerShell, but uh, ADAC makes it very, very easy. You just open up ADAC, you go to uh, the name of your the domain that you want to create the fine grained passwords for, uh, go to system, and then the password settings container. So when you open that up, you're going to see uh, a very similar page to what we saw before. So it's the same settings for minimum length, maximum length, enforced password history. Uh, the main difference on this page is at the very bottom where it says directly applies to. So by selecting add here, you can add um, any security group that you want, uh, any individual users, uh, et cetera. So those are really um, the, high, the high overview of your, your password policies. So now we're gonna talk about some other things that actually exist within Active Directory to help you with a, you know, sensitive type of accounts that exist. And uh, there's a lot of different ways that uh, passwords can be managed depending on the account that these passwords are being used with. So one way to do this is the protected users group, or as we at Trimark like to call it, the forgotten group. Um, we call it the forgotten group because I, for instance, I look at Active Directory environments uh, every single day, and it is very rare that uh, we see organizations using protected users group. Um, a lot of times when we do see them using it, they're not using it completely, um, or they're not using it up to its full potential. So the protected users group is a built-in group in Active Directory, and its whole purpose is just to mitigate credential exposure. So all of the places that one can imagine that you log into in an Active Directory environment, like all these normal places where your credentials would be cached, uh, the protected users group prevents all of that from happening. So um, credential delegation from Credit SSP is not, is not cached. 
uh, Windows Digest is not cached. NTLM authentication is not even allowed. Uh, constrained or unconstrained delegation is not allowed with this with this account. Um, downplaying encryption will not work as DES or RC4 keys are no longer compatible. Um, so AES keys have to be used as well as Kerberos. So one thing that I want to point out when using the protected users group, because it, it it sounds a little too good to be true, like this is amazing. I could put all of my all of my privileged users into this and I don't have to worry about their credentials being left on any machine anywhere in my environment. Well, that's potentially true, but there are some some downsides to that. Now, one big piece that I want to point out is the third bullet from the bottom that says a cached verifier is not created at sign in or unlock. So offline sign in is no longer supported. And what this means is is whenever uh, a user in Active Directory logs into a local machine, a cached verifier um, is created to know that that user has logged in. It creates that local session that we know about. Um, so let's say a machine gets knocked off of your domain for whatever reason, and now you need to log into this machine so that you can then re-add it back to your domain. In order to do that, you would need either a local administrator account or you would need um, you would need a, a local account to log into the machine, um, or you would need some account that had logged into this machine from your domain prior to this, because those credentials would be cached unless that machine had been restarted. Now, if you have a user, so let's say this is a domain admin, um, and he's in this protected users group, he would not be able to log into a, a computer that's offline. He would not be able to log into a computer that has fallen off the, the domain either because there's no cache credentials here. So if you were using privileged credentials for something where a credential needs to be cached or it needs to hang around the system for some specific reason, uh, the protected user is not the way to go for that. All right, so I'm gonna move Darryl, on. To I, can't, I can't figure out why this group doesn't get more love. Um, it seems like it has a ton of security features, but you say people aren't using it, right? Other than the cash piece, why are people not using it? Uh, you know, it's that's so an surprising. interesting question. That's, yeah. that's an interesting question. I don't know if this is more because people don't know that it's there um, or if they see it there, but they don't necessarily know what it does. Hmm. Um, you know, because uh, in all my writings and readings and research that I've done, I haven't really found a lot of places that they're explicitly talking about the protected users group uh, in depth, yeah. but well, it's been around for Stephanie years. Stephanie Barber just commented and said, because of scheduled tasks. Interesting. Uh, actually, you can you can get around that uh, for scheduled tasks. Um, mm. You can get around that and you can get around that for two different ways. Um, the first way for this for the scheduled task is, well, you can you can create a service. <laughs> Uh, so this is a bit harder. You can create a service and then you could have um, some other account, uh, some other credential that has the ability to start or stop that service to create the scheduled task. And you can run under that context or even run the, the scheduled task under system. The second thing is uh, when you create a scheduled task and you save in your credentials, there's a checkbox. I believe it's a checkbox uh, that you clicked that says do not save um, the user's um, credentials on that machine. And that will allow you to still use the protected users group for that for that scheduled task for that machine. However, you run into the same problem that you run into with the offline machine issue. So if that machine loses internet connectivity and that scheduled task needs to run, it has no way to, co to call back to the domain controller to verify, um, to authenticate. So you do run into some issue thing, issues there, but there, there are ways around it. Um, there are ways around it. Nice. Thank you. Yep. Uh, service accounts. So service accounts uh, for this particular talk, when I talk about service to service accounts, I'm speaking about actual active directory service accounts that have service principal names that are assigned to them, um, not just an account that is used to administer like a third party piece of software or something like that. Um, okay, so these service accounts, so service accounts typically have high privileges or a lot of times they have at least high privileges over a particular service. Um, that's why they're created. 
Um, it's also the reason why they are frequently targeted. Um, because services just kind of run and they're meant to, to do their own thing, uh, password rotation a lot of times is not in place and management of, of uh, you know, service account password rotation can be a little bit hard depending on what those services are serving out. You know, if it's something that it's some service that can never go down, it can be very tricky uh, in order to rotate out a password, especially if you have uh, multiple instances of that same service. So Active Directory, well, really Microsoft within Active Directory implemented uh, managed service accounts to help facilitate with just this. Um, and kind of circling back, because I do Active Directory security assessments um, just about every day, uh, you're going to see all kinds of, of different numbers that come out as to how long a service account's password should be, right? 15 characters, 20 characters, 18 characters, et cetera. Um, at Trimark, uh, we, we exclusively or explicitly tell our, our um, customers for service accounts, it should be at least 35 characters. So that gives you an idea of how complex the uh, the attacking method methodology Crazy. has become around <laughs> cracking passwords now. Um, you know, people have these these password rigs that can be created. You can create them in the cloud. You know, you got VMs to spin up these machines very quickly. Um, so because of that, it, you know, password management is really becoming something that we need to pay a lot more attention to. All right, so circling back to uh, group managed service accounts. So group managed service accounts were introduced in server 2016. They actually replaced, well, they were in addition to standalone managed service accounts, uh, which were introduced in Where's server 2012. No, What's that? Yes, yes, yes. In terms of what Mark said, yes, feed his ego. I think we got somebody we need to mute there. I muted him. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, they were in addition to standalone managed service accounts from 2012. The reason you never hear about standalone managed service accounts anymore is because once group managed service accounts came out, you no longer need a standalone. Uh, group managed can do standalone stuff as well as group managed service uh, services. So what group managed service accounts allow you to do is they allow for Active Directory to manage the service account password. So you as the end user never have to worry about what the what the password is for your uh, for any given service. If you need to modify a service's uh, password, you would interact directly with the key distribution center located on the domain controller, request a new password. The DCs interact with that service account. They modify the password and you as a human never need to see it. Um, that password is rotated and, and is also backed up uh, within Active Directory without any human interaction. Now, one of the things that makes group managed service accounts a huge improvement over standalone service accounts is in the implementation of multiple instances of the same service. So if you've got a server farm and it's got you know five instances of the, the same service, right? Some authentication service or something like that. In the past, when you needed to update, uh, when you needed to update the password for that service, there, that was a multi-step process because at any given time, if you had all of those instances up while you were making changes to the password, potentially some of those instances would have different passwords than other ones. So you have to do, I'm going to drop two of these and then change these two and then, then bring these back up. And as admins, we've, we've all been there. Uh, group managed service accounts make this very easy with a one-liner uh, via PowerShell to your domain controller. All of the passwords across all instances are updated uh, immediately. So much easier from, a, from an overhead standpoint. All right, so now we're going to get into local administrator accounts. So local administrator accounts are built into every single version of Windows. Um, it's the first account created during install. Uh, obviously, this is assuming that this is a normal install. We're not talking about any kind of sysprep or imaging or anything else like that. But um, a first, first account created during install, and it is frequently targeted uh, because, again, it is enabled by default and it doesn't expire by default. Again, with these types of accounts that just kind of hang around and don't do much, 
a lot of times there's not a strong password rotation plan that's in place um, or which means that you can come across an account that may not have had its password changed since you know 20, 2010 or you know 2005 um, why that's good for an attacker is it wasn't even until 2022 when the study came out that a password uh, shorter than eight characters could be broken um, within 40 minutes so imagine what the thought process was on password complexity back in 2005. Uh, so that password is probably much, much weaker uh, than a current password would be. So uh, Microsoft created uh, Windows Labs in order to facilitate this. And to facilitate that. And uh, more accurately, Windows Labs uh, replaced Microsoft Labs. <laughs> The Labs is the name for, uh, you know, for this local administrator password solution. Microsoft has changed the name from Microsoft to Windows so that you know the difference between the older version and the newer version. But if you are running on um, server 2012 or later, you are going to be on Windows Labs pretty much for sure. Um, so Labs works very similarly to the way that uh, managed service accounts works in that Active Directory is going to rotate that password on all local machines. So this is for every local machine uh, in your environment that you have LAPS configured for. Uh, it'll rotate the password out to some random password, and then it'll back that password up to Active Directory. So all of your computer accounts all have completely different and random passwords, and the only place that those passwords are stored are in Active Directory. When a user uh, needs that local administrative password, uh, that password or a version of it can be checked out again from the KDC. Then you're able to log into that local machine. After X amount of time, that password is rotated again. Um, what's an additional cool piece to LAPS that a lot of people do not realize um, you can do is you can actually have LAPS uh, configured for your domain controllers as well and have it back up the directory services restore mode password. Uh, that way you don't have to keep it somewhere else, such as, uh, you know, key pass or, or something else like that. Um, again, it rotates out the local administrator password on a regular basis and then backs it up to the Active Directory. You can use Windows LAPS uh, with Azure AD join machines, um, but in order to do that, you have to use Microsoft and Intune. So what this means is if you're running a hybrid environment, you can either choose one way or the, or the other. You can use Microsoft Intune in order to manage LAPS, or you can use your on-prem act, Active Directory in order to manage LAPS, but you cannot uh, use them both. Uh, whenever you have a, a, a LAPS configuration in your environment, um, all of those LAPS have to point back to the same um, uh, Active Directory environment. So if you're using on-prem LAPS, that's fine. You can still use that with Azure AD join machines and vice versa, but you will have to choose in hybrid environments. Um, LAPS does require uh, an AD schema change. So you update it, uh, you modify it, and then you end up with uh, these new settings under group policy that you can actually make changes to LAPS with. Now, I have provided uh, quite a few links on LAPS, the old LAPS, the new LAPS, um, how to set it up. Microsoft has made it really easy nowadays compared to how setting up LAPS was like 10 years ago. All right, so now we're gonna get into group policy preferences for passwords. Um, so this is also known as uh, C pass. So C passwords is the field that is set uh, in group policy preferences. And this is also, in the past, this was used as a way to uh, set administrator passwords on local machines. Um, group policy preferences should never be used to set the local administrator password. Um, there are really cool things that group policy preferences can do, such as modify start menu items, uh, add printers, map network drives and shares. You can change uh, wallpapers and you know all kinds of things, but it should never be used to set the local administrative password. Um, the reason why is the way that group policies are stored is you have your group policy object, but you also have an XML that is stored inside of Sysfall, uh, and that XML has all the different settings for each group policy that you have in your environment. When you create a group policy preference and you set a C password, when you look inside of that file uh, that's related to that group policy, 
you'll see uh, the username in plain text. The C password field will be encrypted and it's encrypted with AES, uh, a really good AES key in fact, but uh, Microsoft publicly disclosed that uh, AES key in 2014 and it's publicly available. So uh, you can reverse you can reverse those passwords uh, very, very easily now. Okay, so up until now, we have talked about why we have passwords. We've talked about where you can set passwords. We've talked about the complexity of passwords and uh, some of the tools that are used to help um, with that complexity in the password rotation. Now, this new, this new piece of technology that was pushed out a couple of years ago from Azure uh, helps to protect against known weak passwords. Right, so it's not looking necessarily at how many uppercase or lowercase or or bangs or hashtags or whatever that you have, um, you know, within the password itself. It's looking to see, well, are you using summer 2022? Are you using winter 3035? Are you using password 123? Let me in. Um, love, sex, God. You know, these very very common uh, passwords that are used all over these all over the place. So. Within Azure AD password protection, it's an addition to your uh, Azure password policy, and it basically gives you two band lists. So you get a, go a global uh, band list that is updated by Microsoft themselves. There's nothing you can do about that list. They they just do everything in the background, and it's it's based on analytics and and breaches and all that stuff in the background. I'm sure some buzzwords like generative AI or whatever comes into play, but uh, there's nothing you can do about that band list. So you can't use any words that are on that band list for password. There is a custom block password list as well, though. So you can add any um, words that you want uh, to, to this band list, and they will be treated the exact same. So let's say that you work for Quest, right? Uh, you may want Quest to be one of your, your custom uh, band words so that Quest cannot be used as a password or Quest Tech or something like that. Um, uh, when it's enabled, Azure AD password protection applies both the ban list uh, to Azure AD password policy without any additional configuration. Um, very, very simple, as you can see here. So in Azure AD, um, if you go to authentication methods, come down to password protection, this is the page that you're going to see. Um, like I said, you don't see that global ban list at all can't even see it, it's just in the background, it just exists, okay? You can change the lockout threshold and uh, your lockout duration of seconds, and you can add uh, any custom band words that you want, right? And whether or not you wanna enforce your custom list. Excuse me. At the bottom of this though, it says password protection for Windows Server Active Directory, enable password protection on Windows Server Active Directory, yes or no, and then mode, enforced or audit. So enable, yes or no, very straightforward, right? Is it turned on or is it turned off? Are you using the feature or not? The enforced versus audit is if you have this turned on and you have it in audit mode, uh, it will still log all of the all of these passwords that have been updated to some known bad password. So you will be able to look in your, your event log, you'll be able to look um, inside of your security center inside of Azure, and you'll be able to see the list of users that have used some kind of bad password. You won't be able to see their password or anything like that, but you'll be able to see that, hey, a, a known bad password was used, but the user will still be able to change their password to it. When you change that from audit to enforced, same thing happens on the logging side, but the user is no longer able to change their password to that word. They'd have to find something that doesn't, doesn't exist within those, uh, those banned password lists. And this is in addition to whatever password policies you already have in place. So whatever complexity that you have in place, this will be in addition to that. Um, what's cool about this is this is Azure AD password protection, but you can use this uh, in an on-premise environment if you have a hybrid environment in place. So there are two additional requirements in order to use Azure AD password protection on-premise and that is an Azure AD password protection agent that's gonna be running on all of your domain controllers. 
and you're going to need an Azure AD password protection proxy service that's running on a member server with internet access. And I've got three, URL, three URLs right here. They're the only URLs that uh, this member server needs to have access to. So when this is configured, you have an agent that is living on uh, your domain controller. Once an hour, that agent is going to request to the proxy service for an updated uh, password policy so that it gets an updated list of these of these banned lists. The password uh, protection proxy service will go to Azure AD. It'll check to see if there's been any changes in the last hour to this policy. If they have, it'll download it and then it'll forward it on to the uh, DC agent, which then saves that list um, in the domain control. If it, if it hasn't, then the member server will just send back the same one that's still current. So when a user goes to make a password change or something else like that, um, LSAS actually passes that off to the DC agent, which then um, looks to make sure and, and does its validation to check that the password that you're trying to change it to doesn't match any of the rules for the, uh, the band global list, as well as being within the password policy. And if it is, the, the user is able to update their password. If not, then the user is not able to, pass, to update their password. But no matter what, uh, this list should never be older than one hour across your entire environment. So this is the latest thing that I have seen as far as protection around um, anything directly password related inside of uh, Azure and, and um, even on-prem Active Directory. And this is mostly because you know Microsoft is really pushing towards passwordless authentication. Um, you can authenticate using certificates and smart cards. Uh, Windows Hello for Business. Um, there's authenticator apps as well as FIDO keys. Um, those are very big topics. Each one of those are huge topics on their own, and they might be something that I, I actually cover in a later talk uh, for pa passwordless versus passwords. Um, but for this talk, that's really what your options are around properly protecting your passwords inside of these types of environments. Um, so with that, are there any questions? Hey, Darren, uh, yes. that was fantastic. Yeah, so uh, I'll just let's open it up. Yeah, I just want to, we had a question around the, <clears throat> sorry, the free requirement for uh, using GMSA and is it limited to only Microsoft um, usage and Microsoft applications? To summarize. Yeah, so to question. use to use GMSA, um, the only thing that you're required to to do is to be running uh, Server 2016 uh, later, and I believe you have to be in Forest Functional Mode of 2012 R2 or later. Uh, but there's nothing you have to install or anything else like that. It's it's there out of the box. Um, and you can easily check for it in your in your Active Directory environment just by trying to run the commandlet in PowerShell. Um, the second piece to that question was it limited to uh, Microsoft services? It, I would so technically the answer is no, but for all intents and purposes, the answer is yes. Um, and the reason why is because it it relies on accounts that use a service principal name. So if you've got you know, a realm set up and you're doing some cool stuff with Unix or Linux or something else like that, and you've got service accounts that are there, as long as they are service accounts that I can that can authenticate to Active Directory and they have service principal names, you should be able to use them with uh, GMSAs. But it does have to be an account that has a, a service principal name. So that's the limitation. Thank you. We also have one question around the password, um, password less. So how does password protection works? uh oh sorry yeah was it this one yeah oh yeah with common passwordless authentication types can password be expired and the users still log on with their smart card windows hello for business or other passwordless uh, factor uh yes yes and no <laughs> yes and no so that de that depends on what you're using how you have it configured like, like i said for the password list one that is a a very very big big talk um but what i will say uh for example there there have been a lot of attacks around um active directory certificate services in the fact that you can modify a password for a user account but if that user has a, a client certificate that's issued to them 
no new client certificate needs to be used. So if you've got a user and you do, you also have client auth in your environment, let's say that user has a, a credential breach, right? And so, you know, you, you lock down the account, you have the user change their password, then you re-enable the account, right? You actually need to re, you, you need to reissue out a certificate again as well, because that same certificate that they have has not, has not been modified. It's not directly tied to uh, the password. Now, whether or not that account is enabled, that's a different thing. But uh, yeah, using something like certificate services um, or um, even even like I believe with Windows Hello for Business, don't don't quote me on that. But I do believe with Windows Hello for Business, that might be true. It's definitely true for uh, standard Windows Hello. But um, yeah, certificate services not directly tied to the password for authentication. Uh, we also have a question on your, so your thoughts on Microsoft complexity requirements when Azure password protection is in, in place. Um, so I don't think that having um, Azure password protection in place should affect the way that you approach your complexity in your environment. You should approach your complexity the same way regardless uh, because they're, they're looking for two different things, right? Um, because I can have a very, so for instance, um, you know, uh, capital T, this this is my password, one, two, three, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. It's technically a, a pretty complex password, but um, that would not pass uh, on a banned list. So you have to look at them as two different things that they're looking for, right? One is looking to see how long you want, to, how long you want your password to be and like what characters do you want to be used? And then that, that password protection is just, well-known passwords, words that we know that people use on a regular basis. And actually another cool feature that I didn't say about uh, the password protection is it uh, it's iterative. So if you, for instance, put password one, two, three in your custom band list, I'm sure this is already on the global band list, but let's say you put password one, two, three on the custom band list, and then the user tried to change their password to password one, two, three, four, or password three, two, one, or password four, five, six, or something like that. None of those would work. And on, on the same topics, um, I saw different studies where, so you mentioned the 39 minutes for a character long password, and you look at two years ago compared to 2023, the difference is what used to take nine months now takes six days. So yep. uh, what's your perspective on, on that and, and where are we going? Is the machine um, growing faster than, than our behavior? And AI is only making it worse, right? So I think I think this is this is where uh, using the tools that exist within the environment come into play, right? Uh, so looking at this from a central management standpoint, uh, my standard users, my, my standard everyday users don't have any kind of privileges to anything aside from their own standard level stuff, right? So none of them are admins. I, I've got my admin accounts segregated. My service accounts are segregated. Um, so it's really those admin accounts and those service accounts uh, that I'm, I'm focused on is around how I really specifically manage those passwords, right? Um, if if Johnny Johnny down... And, and you know Johnny, the the admin, uh, gets his his password compromised, but he's just a standard user. Okay, well we just disable his account. We have him reset his password. We make sure there's there's nothing else going on, and that's fine. But if you have an admin who gets their account compromised, you know that's a much bigger deal. So I think the focus should be on those sensitive accounts, how you can protect them, right? So depending on how you're using those accounts, should you be using um, the protected users group? Should you use user account control to say that this account cannot be delegated? Should you be using, um, you know, group manage service accounts, you know, these kind of things um, in, in your environment? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, but that's also why, like I said, you know, at Trimark, we tell our customers, that regardless of what you read online, we always suggest 35 characters at minimum um, for our service accounts. And one of the reasons for that is to be far ahead of whatever the your your day to day. Like if you were to Google what is a what is a um, you know a best recommendation 
for the length of a service account, we want to make sure that what we recommend is far longer than that because th that that length gets longer exponentially. What it is this year, it's going to be probably twice as long next year and, and even longer and even longer, right? Um, until everybody somehow is able to use MFA or 2FA or something against everything. But um, I do think you have to attack it twofold, your standard users and your standard accounts versus your sensitive accounts. And you just do the extra diligence with those those sensitive accounts. Hey, Daryl, there's one question that just came in. Uh, we noticed in our hybrid environment when the user's password has expired on premise, it still works properly in Azure AD. Is there any way for the password to expire in Azure AD as well? Um, Someone said Azure, Azure AD Connect, there might be a setting. Yeah, so it is, it's an Azure AD Connect. So oh, there they're, they're saying when it, when it expires on premise and then they're still able to Correct. log in on prem. Yeah, so I believe that's, uh, you, have it, you have it in pass through mode, I believe that is. Um, but if you look up the um, Azure AD Connect authentication modes, there's pass, pass through mode and then there's mm -hmm. um, pass, uh, hash synchronization. And I believe right. what you're looking for is hash synchronization. Because um, with hash synchronization, it takes whatever the password is that the user has on premise, takes that hash, hashes it again, and then sends that up to uh, Azure AD. So those are always the same. When you, when you change one on premise, it triggers that sync again and, and it modifies it. And when if you it have expires on premise, it'll still, ex, you know, air quotes expire it in Azure AD. Right. Hmm. When you have well, when you have pass through, I don't think that that's the way that that works. When you're coming in from Azure AD, now if you were on prem and you tried to access an Azure resource, you would be blocked. But if you were coming from Azure, it's going to authenticate you in Azure and not authenticate you on premise. So if your Azure account was still good and enabled, and for whatever reason that sync hadn't happened, yeah, you could you could still log in that way. Nice. Um, but that's that's something to to just tread lightly. Uh, make sure you do your research around those two pass through versus um, hash synchronization. Um, they do work quite a bit differently, and depending on what your environment is set up like, one may not work. One may just not work at all for your environment, depending on if you have cloud apps or on premise apps and that kind of thing. So you may want to look into that. Uh, any other questions? Um, there is one more here. If using a 35 character password, do you also recommend regular rotation? Some vendors are talking about not changing longer complex passwords. No, absolutely. Password rotation is key. Absolutely. Uh, because there's, there's okay, no way. Because I've heard the like same thing too, when you have a long password that it's not required. Or not as often, I would say, is the is the word. So this is this is that idea of security through obscurity. So yeah. you're, you're, you're speaking statistics as opposed to security, right? So statistically, that password mm -hmm. could hang around longer before it's breached. But from a security standpoint, it's just right. as vulnerable as any other password, right? And I'll give you a perfect example. Is for a Kerber roast attack in Active Directory. With Kerber roasting, I request a service ticket for some, some service account. I, I get the hash of that service ticket, which is going to be the hash of the, uh, the password for that service account. And now I take that offline and I try to crack it offline. So I've only had one legitimate interaction with, with your environment. So I don't necessarily care if your password is 10 characters or 15 characters, because I'm just going to put this in my cracking rig and, and walk away. If it takes six months or seven months, it's fine, because based on that logic, you're not changing that password anytime soon anyway. So I would I would tread lightly on that password rotation. Very important. All right, so I think I think we did we answer all the questions. Uh, we got we got there, and we and uh, 
what an awesome presentation and uh, prompted so much good discussion at the end. Um, and uh, if you could back up one slide, Daryl, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, let's give some applause and appreciation for for Daryl here. Um, I've seen him in person a couple times, and it's 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 really impressive. And this was just as impressive. And I I appreciate the way you tailored this for. Um, the uh, the online version. We we do have another tech talk coming up soon on uh, November thirtieth. So right for Thanksgiving for those in the United States. A um, little bit different topic: zero trust and Microsoft three sixty five. So some security strategy. I put a link into the chat if you want to register for that. If you register for this, you should be able to get that link as well. Um, and also, if you zoom to the the next slide here. Um, about next year in Dallas, we're changing locations. Um, uh, my uh, state that I live in right now, and uh, we'll we'll be up there. Um, I say up there because I'm in Austin. So, um, you know, not never too early to register for that as well. And um, Daryl, if you're still on, I don't know if you had to drop because you might have some other obligation. But oh, is there absolutely. a way for people to? Is there a way for people to get in touch with you? Um, I feel like we might have been remiss about that. Uh, yeah, so I'm right here. Uh, oh, there deferred. we go. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so I'm at different let's, deferred. Let's... All right. And, so uh, you can uh, in find, case you people can find me on everything, you can find me on everything there: LinkedIn, GitHub, uh, Twitter. Nice. I'm on everything. Nice. So yeah, multiple opportunities. Yeah, so I was I was uh, monitoring the chat. So, what like? Oh man, the comments coming in are great. So, um, what an awesome job! And um, I think with with that, we'll we'll close it. So, uh, thank you all for attending, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.